Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's CM Radio Deep Dive Get with the program Data Governance Done Right, sponsored today by Attunity. It is a deep dive and continuing conversation from a live DM radio broadcast a few weeks ago, which if you missed, you can go listen to it on demand at dmradio.biz under podcasts. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DM Radio. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn the webinar over to Eric Cavanaugh, the host of DM Radio, to introduce today's webinar and speaker, Eric. Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for that introduction, Shannon, and thanks to all of you for being here today. We're going to have a very interesting webcast, and we're going to get really topical. We don't normally get the chance to be this topical, but we got a chance today. The timing just turned out to be rather serendipitous about events in the world, and it's in particular in Washington, D.C. The topic, as you heard, is get with the program, data governance done right. So let's dive right in. There's a slide about our speakers. I'll be talking to Matthew Hayes, VP of SAP Business at Attunity today, and there's yours truly on the right-hand side. Quick note, feel free to tweet with a hashtag of DM Radio. We'll try to monitor that during the show. So let's dive right in. Headwinds are approaching, my friends, for those who don't recognize that rather unsettling image. That was Katrina shortly before she made landfall way back in 2005. I just thought of that as an interesting image because things are changing in the business world, folks. I promise you there is a whole new wave of regulations approaching us right now. It's going to be more difficult to do business is the bottom line. You know, I've been in this business for about 20-odd years now in the industry of information management, and we usually view information as an asset, as something to be used, to be leveraged for all sorts of different reasons. We'll talk about that. But there are headwinds right now, and we're going to learn about that in our broadcast today. And large organizations in particular, especially those in heavily regulated industries like financial services and healthcare, are particularly in the crosshairs. So let's take a look at the past. Remember this guy, good old Jeff Skilling, remember Enron? I actually watched his testimony live. I just happened to be home that day way back in early 2002 in February. And I watched his testimony, and uh, I have to say, at the risk of sounding like I'm defending him because I'm not, the man was incredibly smart and skillful and did a tremendous job just weaving all around the congressional interrogators. Of course, he, he got his comeuppance in the end. But what happened? Of course, that was Enron. There were some really bad things that went on, some terrible shenanigans in the accounting space, and it led to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which was a very far-reaching set of regulations that came out of Congress and really fundamentally changed the responsibility level and the penalties and the protocols for board members, for accounting in general, and had a lot of effect on business overall. And honestly, the SOX compliance issues were really serious for quite some, some, some time. It's still out there. SOX, you don't hear about it too much anymore, but SOX is still a very major component of big business these days in terms of how you're supposed to report. Of course, it had dramatic impact on the accounting field for obvious reasons. And I would say that we're right now on the precipice of another sea change that is just as significant, just as far-reaching. So what am I talking about there? Well, who watched the news yesterday? I actually took this shot of poor Jeff Zuckerberg. He did not look good. My goodness, the man looked like he had just seen 87 million ghosts. Of course, this is the big scandal, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where this company apparently was able to access tons, just tremendous amounts of data from Facebook, correlate it with data from the so-called dark web, and then use that information to do very targeted advertisements and content sharing, potentially fake news, as we've heard about over the last couple of years, and arguably had some significant impact on the election. Well, this is obviously very, very serious stuff, folks. I mean, we're talking about a deep and fundamental violation of privacy in lots of different ways. A lot of us in the business 
know that this is just the way things work these days, and frankly, trying to rein it in is not going to be easy. In fact, uh, Facebook yesterday talked about an AI engine that will be used to screen content, aka censor. We all hear about terms like hate speech as one of the things that they use. But the point is that we're seeing a very significant development in the industry right now, and it's all about the data. That's the key. It's all about the data and responsibility and practices and policies around data management. Of course, Facebook does have all sorts of different policies and different levels, different thresholds, different privacy settings that you can choose to use or not use. But as we discovered, some entities, partners, in fact, with Facebook have been able to pull out tremendous amounts of data and do some pretty remarkable things with them. Well, what, if you watched the testimony yesterday, you heard the straws in the wind that I heard. And uh, it's interesting because there is a major set of regulation coming out of the EU right now, or very soon. In fact, May 25th, I think, is the deadline when it kicks into place. It's called GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. And uh, let's face it, it's coming this way. So technically, it's for the EU, but it's also affecting U.S. companies who have customers in the EU. And I'm bringing this up because I think yesterday's events finally brought into focus for many American companies what the EU has been talking about for a while. And I would argue, and I've said this to several analyst friends of mine, we are about to see regulation of social media, and that regulation is probably going to, to move into the areas of data protection and data privacy at the same time because of all the breaches that we've seen. We've heard all these just amazing stories about massive breaches of data, of security protocols like passwords, all these things are combined to create a very strange and troubling environment out there in the world of information management. So several of the senators who were questioning Mark Zuckerberg asked him, do you think the Europeans have it right? This is what they're talking about. So let's just take a step back and think about what this all means, right, especially from a data governance perspective. Because you talk about governance, you talk about policies and procedures and protocols and rules and regulations and how you actually manage the collection, the use, the analysis of data, that's what governance is all about. So for the entire time of my career, we've viewed data as an asset, right? It fuels business, it fuels transactions, it can be analyzed to improve various processes, to streamline processes, to understand market opportunities, to figure out which new products to roll out, to figure out where you should roll them out, how should you market them. There are countless positive ways that data can be used to improve business. And of course, at the end of the day, what you really want to do is improve that customer experience. You want to have a data policy and a, a set of regulations and protocols that collectively result in you taking care of your customers and not jeopardizing their privacy, not jeopardizing the sanctity of their data. Well, that's one side of the equation, but there's another side of the equation. Data is also a liability. So as we've seen in recent years, it certainly can and will be used against people. It can be stolen. Uh, it can result in very serious fines with GDPR. It's something like 4% of what they call annual turnover, which basically means gross revenue. Can you imagine if Facebook gets tagged by the EU, by the GDPR, for 4% of their gross revenue? Holy Christmas. Some people were saying this could be the beginning of the end for Facebook remains to be seen. I doubt that's going to happen, quite frankly. But the point is, that's how serious the situation is. And there are other major, major organizations that have had these huge data breaches. And all of this speaks, once again, to the importance of governance, the importance of having procedures and policies in place. And the people in the data governance field know that. We've been working on this stuff for years. Only recently has it become top of mind for many businesses. I can tell you from my perspective as a marketer in the field of data management, data governance two, three, four, six, seven, eight, ten years ago, snoozer. <laughs> you could send out an email blast with data governance in the headline, and you'd be lucky if you know five percent of the people opened it. You'd be lucky if it, maybe five percent of those people actually clicked on something. It just wasn't very interesting. We were more interested in business intelligence, data warehousing, analytics, big data, IoT, all this stuff. But now, in the last two years, from my experience, and I'm squarely in this field, I can tell you that data governance is now a very hot topic. Many organizations realize why. And that's why I'm saying this recent event with Facebook 
just testifying before Congress yesterday and today, I promise you it spells a future raft of regulations that are coming down the pike, and I would recommend that all of you out there be prepared for that. So it actually brings to light an old concept, data life cycle management. Who's been in the business long enough to know what that means? Well, that's basically cradle to grave. So you have a policy for how you deal with when you access data, when you grab that data or create the data in the first place, how it is managed over its life cycle, how it's used, where it's used, who uses it, all that kind of fun stuff, all the way until the end. Now think about data lakes. We keep talking about data lakes, and there is a presumption in a data lake conversation that you want to save all that data and use it because someday you might be able to analyze it. Well, analyzing past behavior of customers, for example, can be very useful to understand and to customize the experience for those customers. If you have a big complete picture, that so-called 360 degree view of a customer or a client or a partner or some corporate entity, that can be very useful. So the tendency is to think we should keep this data forever. I promise you that is gonna change. Um, there are e issues like e-discovery in the field of, of uh, legal worlds. You want to be concerned about what you keep around. You only want to keep data as long as you have to keep it, because if you keep it any longer, it's just going to turn up in some e-discovery search and can be used against you. So I promise that is going to fundamentally come back into the picture, data lifecycle management. What's old is new again. We're going to have policies that are much more shrewd about dealing with data, and we'll talk about that later on the show. Specifically, one part of the GDPR is this so-called right to be forgotten. Well, the right to be forgotten basically says that if someone, a consumer, wants XYZ Corporation to not maintain their personal data anymore, that company has to go find it and eradicate it. Well, that's going to be tough, I can tell you right now. Think about Google. Think about Facebook. Think about LinkedIn. But then think about all of the big box retailers, all these companies in the Fortune 2000. They have tremendous amounts of data about you. And just to be completely blunt, the objective here, I think, is frankly unachievable. There's really no way that organizations are going to be able to find every last tidbit of data about you and get rid of it. So what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to focus on critical data assets, and mostly that's going to be data in production. So the production data that is running operations for these companies, that's where they're going to need to have obfuscation or eradication or some other mechanism for making that data go away. So what does this mean for data governance professionals? What does this mean for organizations everywhere? Well, I love it when a plan comes together. I think the bottom line is we're going to have to have a plan. And again, if you think about the regulator's perspective, a regulator comes in, an auditor comes in, think about when the Enron collapse happened. Auditors came in, they started poking around and looking for stuff. Well, if and when that happens, I guarantee you're going to be much better off if you have a plan in place a data governance plan that is achievable, that is effective, that has some really good thought that's gone into it, and that is defensible. And this is the key, because again, I think a lot of times it's going to be impossible to track everything down, but the regulators are going to be reasonable people, most likely. So if you have a plan in place and you demonstrate that you're acting on that plan, you're going to be okay. So what is data governance? Well, really there are four corners to data governance, people, technology, data, and processes. Now one of the challenges is that most organizations have scores, if not hundreds, of information systems. Those systems are not very well connected, just to be blunt. A lot of times they are connected in fairly fragile ways or fairly limited ways. And frankly, that's why we wound up with the whole concept of data warehousing years ago, was to pull data together from multiple sources, be able to put it into a warehouse, and then analyze it. Well, we learned a lot over those years. We learned about how to move data. We learned about data movement policies. We learned about access policies, et cetera. These are all critical components in having some sort of a data governance plan. I think we will see technologies like data catalogs really come along and fill a lot of the gaps. But nonetheless, by and large, organizations will need a whole complement of technologies and a whole host of different processes and procedures and policies to be able to manage that kind of thing, to be able to have a plan, once again, that you can put into place that is effective, that is moving through time and getting better over time, and that is defensible to the regulators. So this is all really important stuff. 
And one of the key issues really in terms of policy is that typically a policy, if it's not dynamically connected to an information system, it's not very enforceable. If you rely on people to read policy documents and then just behave in a certain way, that's not a very defensible posture. But the problem is that very few policy systems are dynamic enough to connect to operational systems and enforce those policies, especially if you want to change those policies over time. We're getting there. It's starting to change a little bit. But this gets us into the whole space of risk management. And yours truly actually spent a number of years focused on the GRC space, governance, risk management, and compliance. Well, control points are a key component in any governance program, in any risk management program. And let's face it, a lot of these things are overlapping now. And this actually is one of the challenges for data governance because you have lots of different teams whose behavior or activities either overlap in the data governance space or should be controlled or at least shepherded by a data governance program. Anyone in a large organization knows it's very difficult to get all those cats herded together and to get people to listen to you and to follow rules and so forth. Ideally, you want some kind of a technology that's going to manage that. I think we're going to see that space light up in the next two to four years, quite frankly. But the, the control point is a very key component of governance. A human being is a walking, talking control point. A human being can be a control point at almost any point in the day. It's uh, a control point at some point at which you can leverage control, at which you can make some change. Turn it on, turn it off. Give someone access, take the access away. These are the kinds of things you need to be able to do if you are going to have some kind of effective governance program. But really, any access point to a software application, well, what does that mean these days? APIs. APIs are control points. Application program interfaces, this is how the cloud communicates these days, and an API is a control point. Well, artificial intelligence is going to throw a pretty hard curveball at this whole scenario, and we're going to watch as that plays out as well, because AI theoretically is also representing a control point, but it's a kind of a difficult one to manage. But any point at which data is entered or modified in an information system, that is a control point. You need to have those control points outlined in your plan. So here again, this is what I was talking about a minute ago, the power, power and problems with policy. Unless policies are dynamically connected to information systems, it's going to be very difficult to make them work. So I think that this is going to require a lot of time, a lot of attention. You know, there are certain basic protocols like LDAP, of course, where you can control access to different systems. One of the nice things about the cloud, as a matter of fact, is that so much metadata and so much policy is baked into these cloud platforms, whereas in the old days, because it was all done manually and you had disjointed systems, just finding the, the language, finding the, um, the instructions for where things are stored was kind of a challenge, quite frankly. But a lot of these new data catalog technologies are excellent at just basically crawling through your landscape, finding all the different systems, and helping you ferret out where those control points are. So it's going to be really critical in helping companies get good, robust, solid data governance programs in place that are defensible if and when someone comes knocking. And my last slide before I hand it off to Matt Hayes of Attunity, who's going to go into this whole right to be forgotten, which is a significant component of GDPR, is attention architects and modelers. You know, over the years, you could control access and you could manage policy really either where the data lived or where the application lived that was referencing the data or using the data. So either at the bottom or the top. But if you think about most even mid-sized organizations, you've got scores, again, if not hundreds of applications. So trying to manage access across a whole range of disparate applications, that's tough. I mean, it's borderline impossible. I will say there is one big benefit in this case of using a big box retailer like an SAP, for example, which, let's face it, focuses on core business processes. That's where SAP makes a lot of their money is core business process, enterprise resource planning, and all the basic functionality around that, accounting, for example, um, transactions for procurement, all that stuff. If you have a system from one vendor that manages all that stuff, well, then you're, you're actually able to curtail at least a significant amount of the negative activity through policy management. But the other very interesting thing that's happened in the last couple of years is a lot of data modeling technology has started to adopt policy management. And if you think about 
enterprise architecture, if you think about data models, one of the cool things about them is that they extend through the entire information landscape. So now in your models and some of these newer technologies, you can actually bake in attributes or rules, policies, for access to information. And what you obviously want is to be able to enforce controls, change those policies as laws change or as the board decides to move in different directions, and be able to have visibility and auditability through all of that, through that entire matrix. So I think data modelers and information architects are in a very good position right now to help their organizations tackle this rather significant challenge of data governance. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Matt Hayes of Attunity. Matt Hayes, take it away. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. And um, yeah, it, what a great presentation. Um, you know, this, this, the GDPR problem is something that most companies uh, globally are going to have to face. It's focused on the EU right now. But this is uh, this might this might be the model moving forward, um, Eric. Like you, I was watching a little bit of the Zuckerberg testimony this morning, and you know it's clear that this is this is really it, you know circling down into uh, a compliance issue that's going to be that's going to be handled at a, at a governance standpoint. Um, you know, it, it feels like every week we we wake up and we hear more we hear about a new data breach. You know, it's it's like you know I heard Panera Bread had something. Um, not so long ago. So you have all these little ones where there's some level of exposure, um, but then, then there's a big one. And, um, you know, the, the Facebook one is something that affects everybody. Uh, there's, there's, there's not a lot of, not a lot of people out there that don't have, that aren't either on social media themselves or, uh, have family and friends and shit and kids on, on social media. So, uh, data is definitely an issue and the protection of that data is an issue. So, um, as, as, as we get into this, um, I'm gonna zero in on a couple on a couple specific uh, concepts around GDPR. Um, first of all, a little bit about Attunity. So, so my role, my name is Matt Hayes. I'm the VP of SAP Business at Attunity. I focus squarely on our, our data solutions for the SAP market. So we work with companies' data all the time, or we help companies work with their data. Um, we help companies provide data or provision data uh, from wherever it is to wherever it needs to be. So, for example, if you wanted to uh, copy a, uh, some, some production data down into a sandbox or a test environment, we can help companies leverage, leverage uh, their SAP data in that fashion, um, but we can also uh, help companies replicate data. So, Eric, you mentioned data lakes. Data lakes are definitely something that's a growing concept, uh, you know, for, for large enterprises today. Um, people, use, people are using Hadoop for, um, uh, for distributed data lakes, they're using cloud-based technologies. You know, all you have to do is look at look at what Microsoft is doing with Azure, or looking at what Amazon or AWS is doing with with their products. And there's a number of products out there that help companies uh, move and store data. Uh, some of these are just basic landing spots for data. Other places are more, are more uh, thorough um, data, uh, data warehouse models, so that you can actually churn and burn on that data and make make good business decisions. So the two products that, that we have at Attunity that deal with data uh, that we'll focus on here are Attunity Gold Client and Attunity Replicate. Attunity Gold Client focuses specifically on SAP test data management, so the, the, the ability to provide production data into testing environments. This is a product that we've had in the market for over 15 years. Obviously, providing production data into a non-production system creates exposure. So what I'm going to get into is some, some protections and scrambling and obfuscation rules that we've had in that product for many, many years uh, that right now has, has worked itself right into the sweet spot for GDPR compliance. And of course, with data replication, any time that you're replicating data from a system of record to something else, you want to make sure that whatever, whatever protections you've taken uh, into consideration in that system of record that you can transcend those protections downstream to wherever that data is going. Um, that was literally no pun intended. I said downstream, and we're talking about data lakes, but um, that's just happening in my head right now. Um, so oh, the, <laughs> the focus for GDPR that we look at is the right to be forgotten. Um, you know, there's a lot of aspects of this of this uh, of of GDPR. Um, some of them. Uh, revolve, some of the requirements revolve around reporting when there is a breach. Some of them uh, involve uh, being able to provide data to you, so if you can take your data with you to another, to another uh, company or another vendor. 
Um, some of them deal with, uh, you know, something as basic as opting in and opting out of communications with a company. So right to be forgotten, though, has, has deals specifically with PII data, which is your personally identifiable information. Um, I apologize. I have a tendency to talk ahead of my slides, and uh, I got a little bit ahead of myself here. Um, here's another slide that basically covers what we do on uh, providing data anytime, any, any data, any place, anytime. Um, lets you kind of see what we do there with Gold Client, with Replicate. Uh, we also have some data automation, data warehouse automation software with a product called Compose. And then we have a product called Visibility that helps with um, optimization of uh, data, data optimization. So where you're managing that data, we can help identify hot and cold data, what, what's being used, what's not being used, and help you move off the data that's not being used. So uh, back to kind of some of the areas that, that Eric's already covered. Uh, May 25th, that's the drop dead date. So that's when this all goes into effect, and, and it remains to be seen how, uh, how aggressive uh, the EU is going to be at enforcing this. So there's a lot of people fe feeling that they're going to be, um, there's a lot of people that, that, are gonna, that, are, that feel that they're going to be pretty aggressive right out of the gate to make sure companies are ready for this, uh, because obviously m many of them are not. Um, so the fines are a big one, um, you know, 20 million euro or 4% of your annual turnover, tremendous amount of, of, of uh, exposure here for a lot of companies. And this is, these are numbers that get, that get uh, CEOs' attention. So um, it's obviously designed as a, as a mechanism to help companies take this seriously and realize that, that it's, better to, it's better to be compliant with GDPR than it is to just pay the fines as you go. Um, so getting, in, getting into it a little bit here, uh, PII, uh, personally identifiable information. You'll hear me talk about PII quite a bit. So PII is basically data that, that helps uh, you identify an individual. So obviously something like your name, uh, your, street, your address, your phone number, your email address, anything, anything at all, any aspects of the data at all that can make it so that people can figure out uh, who you are. Um, and of course, when when you've got PII data, um, when when you've got PII data in a system, uh, you've got data that comes off of that. So if you're a customer, then uh, you obviously have transactional history. You've done business with that company. So there's there's transactions that come off of that. Um, the business needs to be able to use those transactions, uh, in you know, in addition to your data. So some companies will will want to use your data to market directly to you. Other companies might look at the order history in order to do their supply chain planning and figure out um, how, how they need to plan their business. So, but the PII data is uh, the, the stuff that's at risk here. And, um, and, and what we're going to be talking about is specifically systems of record and specifically in this webinar we're talking about SAP because that's, that's what I deal with. So companies that run SAP are typically going to be companies that are very large in nature. A lot of the Fortune 500, the Global 2000, um, these are companies that, that run their business on SAP. So SAP is often the system of record. That's where their customers are managed, their vendors, uh, they, they'll run payroll, so employees might, employee data might be in there. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of PII exposure in SAP systems. Of course, if you're on the webinar and you don't run SAP, uh, you can, you know, this is analogous to any other uh, system that you run your business on. So, um, uh, you know, again, we're going to, um, you know, my expertise is SAP, so we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that. So, um, you know, what does compliance look like? Uh, you know, having appropriate security of personnel data, um, including protection, protections against unauthorized access, accidental loss, destruction, damage, and what constitutes a breach? Um, you know, breaches when, you know, people have access to that data or there's risk to that data being uh, used outside of its, its intended business purpose. So it's not just about losing the data, it's about who has access to it and what they can, what they can use it for. Um, so given the size of the EU customer base, um, GDPR is really expected to be a, a, a big focus. Uh, it's also not technically prescriptive. This is really interesting because when we talk to customers in Europe, we find that a lot of people say, well, what are we supposed to do? And, um, you know, it's not, it's not a matter of what you're, exactly what you're supposed to do, but you have to, do, you have to be able to, um, you have to be able to interpret the requirements and prove that you're meeting, you're meeting the requirements of the GDPR uh, in, initiatives. So, for example, the right to be forgotten. There's nothing 
in GDPR that says you have to delete and destroy customer data and you have to produce a, you know, A115 report that says blah, 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 blah. So it's not that descriptive. It's just, it just says, you know, you need to be able to do this. You need to be able to demonstrate that if a customer calls you up and says, please get rid of all my data, that you, that you have a mechanism in place to do that. Um, and again, of course, a customer might be stored in numerous systems in your, in your enterprise. Um, SAP could be one of them. You could have data stored in Oracle. You could have data stored in a CRM solution. Something like Salesforce might be, might be an exposure area as well. So you have to kind of look at the, the, the bigger picture. Um, and, and, you know, for us, being in this market, SAP is, uh, is often the system of record. It's, it's, it's often the central place where this data is stored. Um, so high, there are high-level requirements. Evaluate, you have to evaluate how many touch points uh, have PII data. And we're working with companies in the EU, and a lot of it's really obvious. Like I said earlier, name, address, phone number, email address, that stuff's really obvious. But we're seeing requirements come out of customers that are really obscure. So, for example, um, if you have a company car, um, the company car is an asset. So the asset's stored in the system, and there might be information on that asset that says uh, this company vehicle is is currently being um, is currently in the possession of this employee. Uh, it could be the employee number. It could be the employee name. Uh, there might be a uh, license plate information. So again, that's stuff that that qualifies as PII data. If I can go into a company's asset data and pull information on vehicles, and I see I see um, you know who has a company car, what the license plate is. That's, in, that, you know, that's sensitive information, and that's definitely uh, data and information that would be exposed here. So there's going to be some variance uh, between, you know, from company to company that go beyond the obvious. So track, uh, track usage of company records and keep only uh, um, as long as necessary. This, this deals with retention. Um, most companies have data retention policies. Uh, this talks about data lifecycle management. How long does data need to live in your system? Well, for most companies, it, it, it's a legal and a financial question. How long do you need to keep data in your system to be uh, compliant with regulatory tax requirements and things like that? But now this is another factor. Um, you know, if I, haven't, if I have a customer in, in my system that I haven't done business with in six or seven years, I might have a need to keep the transactional history longer, but I might, uh, you know, I might not have a need to keep their PII data. So I might be able to take a customer and, and, and scramble or obfuscate the PII data while retaining their record history so that I can be compliant uh, in multiple areas of governance. Um, so isolating and anonymizing or deleting records on demand is important, and, and this is what I talked about earlier with the right to be forgotten. If a, if a customer calls up and says, you know, get rid of all my data, you need to be able to uh, do it and demonstrate that you, that you have done it. We're obviously working with a lot of companies that want to do this proactively. Uh, they're gonna. The compliance organizations are gonna are gonna set rules in place that say, okay, just to be safe, um, you know, employee data. If we have an employee that hasn't, you know, that that that's left our organization more than five years ago, we want to get rid of their data um, so that we're so that we're not at risk here. So there's definitely going to be some uh, proactive aspects of this, and of course, demonstrating how you comply is key. So this is uh, another thing that's really interesting here is that. In the U.S. here, there's, there, there's not a lot of companies that understand this. Um, you see the bullet at the end that on the go-live date of May 25th, the uh, expectation is that only about 50% of uh, EU companies are going to be uh, GDPR ready. So that's a pretty low number. And, and of course, the level of your uh, readiness is going to vary. Some companies are going to be 10% the way there. Some companies are going to be 60% the way there. Some companies aren't even going to know. Um, so, but when it comes to the U.S., a lot of companies in the U.S., especially if you don't do a lot of business with Europe, you don't know what this impact is going to be. Um, so we've got a quote up there that's kind of funny uh, from a panel discussion. Uh, a major healthcare provider here in the U.S., a $15 billion company, um, the VP of IP said, what's GDPR? They hadn't heard of it before. So this is definitely something that's going to gain more attention and focus as it's enforced. Um, and of course, the high-profile fines, that, that's what's going to that's what's going to get get people's attention. So it all depends on how aggressive um, the EU is in, in enforcing it. So complying with GDPR and managing risk, it's all about managing risk, right? You want to you want to look at your business processes. You may have to re-engineer some business processes to 
um, you know, to, to handle the stuff um, or to make sure that you're, that, that they're optimized for GDPR. Uh, you want to minimize the data. You don't want to, again, the data becomes a liability, like Eric said. Uh, the longer you store the data, the more risk you have. Uh, you need to be able to identify where the PII data is because that's going to be your, your areas of highest risk. And of course, improve security. And improve security is something that, I mean, like that, that's, that's an always ongoing thing, right? Um, you're always protecting the data at its source in your system of record, uh, but you're also, uh, you also need to protect the data when it's being used for testing purposes. Um, if you're testing an upgrade of your system and you're, and you're using production data to do that, you might have that data in a less secure environment um, or, or a system that has less scrutiny than a production system. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of concern around security. Of course, when you move data to data lakes um, or Hadoop, uh, there's different security that's involved there where you have to re-protect the data. So you have to do a lot of assessment. Um, you have to map things out. You have to look at the business case, uh, look at the risk areas, um, and get a detailed roadmap in place. Uh, and that's what we're focusing on with customers is looking at it and saying, okay, the detailed roadmap, what, if we're looking at SAP as a system of record, what data and what pieces of the data? So we're getting down to the table and field level even. So um, Attunity and GDPR, this is, this is something that's very important to us because all we deal with is data. So whether it's data replication, whether it's test data management, like our software deals with our customers' data. So it's really important that this becomes a focus for us. And, um, you know, with it being a focus, we have to look at what our products do already, uh, where our products can be enhanced to help companies be more compliant with GDPR, and if there's any, and if, and if you know, if we create any, uh, you know, if, if there's any risk created by using our software, that we that we raise that with our customers. Um, so the 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 most direct application that we make that that uh, has value for GDPR compliance is our Gold Client product. Again, this would be for companies that run their business on SAP. So our Gold Client product uh, is traditionally used to copy data from a production to a non-production source. So we have functionality in here that anonymizes that data. So we can say, if we're, if we're copying an employee record from production to development, we can change the name, the social security number, the street address, the phone number, uh, the salary information. We can, we can do a lot with that PII data to protect it in a non-production environment. The reason we did that was because, again, the production system is intensely protected with high levels of security. But the minute that you start propagating or proliferating that production data to non-production environments, you now have a different audience of people using that data with different levels of security. So if I copy employee data and customer data from a production system to a sandbox environment, I may have, um, you know, I may have an offshore firm doing some development for me. I may have some outside consultants uh, in the organization. These are people that have IDs and access on the sandbox system. They don't even have IDs in production, so I don't have to worry about it in production. I've got production locked down. But if I'm, if I'm proliferating production data in a sandbox environment and I've got an offshore provider, I've got guys halfway around the world that don't even work for our company that, are, that have now have access to that data. So it's incredibly um, important to protect that data and protect that PII data from unauthorized access. And this is functionality that we've provided through our Gold Client product for 15 years. So many, many SAP customers, and obviously the customers that use our software, um, they use, you know, this is an important feature in our software that they use today. So, you know, the next thing naturally to do is to figure out how that technology can be leveraged for production. And that's what we've done for GDPR. We've taken those rules and made it so that our customers now can apply those rules against the production system and, and, and create that same level of protection and data scrambling at the, at the production level that creates, creates GDPR compliance. So a couple of our other products, um, Attunity Replicate, we have the ability to secure uh, file transfers. There's an audit trail so that you know when you're, when you're proliferating or when you're replicating data from a source to a target. And there's some filtering that uh, you can put into place where you can filter out columns and fields uh, that contain PII data. And then I mentioned earlier that our visibility solution, this, is, this helps companies look at their data warehouse and say, okay, we've got you know, 10 terabytes of data in our data warehouse. What are we using? What are we not using? So visibility gives you that. It, it basically helps you understand the data that you're using 
than the data that you don't use or, or rarely touch. And that data that's, that's not used or rarely touched can easily be either removed or offloaded to, you know, another system or cheaper storage. And if it's PII data, you, you can obviously look at it as a, as a um, opportunity to be destructive with that data uh, to ensure compliance. Um, so, you know, I keep coming back to the right to be forgotten. Um, in, individuals can opt out. Again, customer can call up and say, get rid of my data. Um, you know, you have to erase their, any, any PII data that can attribute the transactional nature of the data with an individual. Um, scramble and obfuscate production data with Gold Client. This is what I just talked about, that we've extended the features and capability of our existing solutions to make it so that that right to be forgotten can be enforced in your SAP system of record. And then scrambling and obfuscating the, 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 the data at the system of record, if you're then replicating that data into data lakes or using it for analytics, you've got another level of protection. So I might, I might want to look at order history and supply chain information in my company over the last five years, but I don't want to have customer data uh, that long. So I might, I might I might use our technology to um, scramble or obfuscate the data in that production system, but now if I'm replicating that data into a data lake, even if I'm replicating the data, you know, the tables and fields that have PII data, if I've already taken care of that data at its source, then there's no data to be, rep no sensitive data to be replicated. So for me, it keeps coming back to the system of record. Where does the data originate? Where does it, where, where do we control it? You know, um, and again, master data management comes into play here. Um, you know, if I've, got, if I've got one system where all my customers are created and then those customers are disseminated to all my other systems, if I've got that one central point where those customers are controlled, as long as, I, as long as I'm compliant there, then I know whatever gets passed downstream to any other systems is going to be protected. It's going gonna, it's gonna to extend that protection. So um, a little bit, again, I've talked about our Gold Client solution. Uh, it might be helpful just to kind of let, let you know um, what that does. So, what that Gold Client product does is it'll let, it lets uh, SAP companies and projects move production data into test sandbox uh, development in environments so that they can test developments, test migrations, test where they're going with their, with their um, ERP solution. Uh, so you can easily select and protect the data. Uh, so we, we can scramble that data prior to it being moved. We can rapidly, rapidly migrate the data, so um, you can move large amounts of data. So if you wanted to move a month's worth of sales order history from production to development, we have the abilities to do that. Uh, we can synchronize data across SAP applications, and this, this applies to the scrambling as well. So if we copy data at the ERP level, SAP has a number of different applications that you might be taking advantage of or using. So, you know, the, the, the data might be generated in the ERP system, but you could be using SAP's CRM, BW, SCM. Uh, there's a number of SAP applications where that data might get extended to. And um, again, if you're scrambling the data at the central point, then as it gets proliferated and copied out to all those extended SAP applications, you extend that protection. And our, our um, you know, us being in the SAP space, we work very closely with SAP and our products are certified with SAP. So we have integrated certification, not only at the SAP application level, but also on, on their HANA and S4 HANA technologies. And for people that aren't aware, um, HANA is the database platform that SAP has built to run their applications on. In the past, or traditionally, you, you'd run SAP applications and run your business on a platform that could, that, 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 that could run on Oracle or SQL or DB2, any kind of database platform. And um, the future of SAP is ensuring that the applications run on their HANA uh, database, which is an in-memory database, very high performance, uh, columnar store, um, a lot of a lot of technical advantages to that to that technology. Um, so again, where Gold Client helps reduce your risk, um, it ensures the customer records that are copied to non-production systems are anonymized. Um, we can precisely delete or or you know delete data. So uh, something like a phone number or an email address, that's not a key field. So Unless you need it, you can just safely blank it out. You don't have to change it to something indistinguishable. You can just blank it out. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, the right to be forgotten extends that scrambling functionality to the production systems. And like I said, we're working with customers in the EU to identify the PII data that they see at risk in their in their SAP um, data model in their landscape. And again, 
I would say 80% of that is consistent, um, and, but about 20% of it's variable from company to company. Uh, so, uh, you know, a little bit technical here, again, on Gold Client, when we copy data from production to non-production, our goal is to help companies move small amounts of reliable, uh, recent production data into these non-production environments. If you run your business on SAP, you may know that uh, the only way to, or the typical way to do this in an SAP environment would be to copy the production system. So there's a lot of SAP companies out there that are copying the entire production system off to a sandbox or a QA or a training environment. And every time that happens, you're moving not only the data that you want, but you're moving all of the data. Everything that you have in your SAP system is getting copied to a less secure non-production environment. And unless you're doing some scrambling using our software or some other method, uh, that, data, that data is as is in that non-production environment. So there's, there's a tremendous exposure there. So we not only help companies reduce that exposure by scrambling the sensitive data, but by moving a subset of the data, um, by moving a subset of the data, that ensures that you're, you know, you're only moving current data from production as opposed to the whole thing. So you don't have some offshore guy halfway around the world running a balance sheet off your sandbox system and then manipulating your stock with it. Um, so again, when we, uh, when we set up these scrambling rules, uh, you, you know, we do this through our software. It's, an, it's, a, it's a customizable user, user interface. Uh, you, you basically select the type of data that you want to scramble and what you want to do to it. Um, the, the rules are mandatory, so there's security within our software that says, you know, if, a, if, if an HR manager, um, uh, if an HR manager sets that scrambling rule, uh, he can make it the default rule. So anytime you're moving HR data throughout your landscape, there's no way to turn it off. It's always on. Um, it's flexible. It's configurable. Um, and it cannot be reverse engineered. So when we scramble the data, the data runs through the scrambling mechanism, and then when we apply the data to the target, whether it be non-production or production, uh, it cannot be removed. It cannot be reversed. And with SAP, that means that we're also having to, to clean up the, the change log history. Um, you can imagine that if you're changing data on a customer record, uh, there's a change log that's created that says, oh, it was this and now, now it's this. So if I change your email address from your real email address to nothing, there's a change record that says, well, it used to be this. So the change record needs protection too. So we need to make sure that, that we do proper cleanup to make sure that, that nobody can reverse engineer the process. Um, it's, you know, there's no, uh, you know, it's not encryption magic where you push a button and everything turns back into what it was. Once you apply the rule, it's applied. It, it, it makes the change and that's a permanent change. So, um, the, the, you know, some, back to you know, summarize the details on what we do, um, you know, the data records and fields are anonymized during the export process or, or at the source. So data never leaves the production system unless it's secured, whether we're scrambling the data directly in production or we're using that data downstream, whether it be a non-production system or, or through data replication, uh, the, the data is controlled um, at the source. Uh, the, the, the rules are, are mandatory. Um, cannot be reverse engineered, and our, any scrambling that we do applies to all SAP applications. Um, the cl compliance can be easily demonstrated because when, when these jobs are run, we have logs that, say, that, that, that point it out. The logs will, will, will note when a job is run, what was done. Uh, it won't have the detail. So if I've just scrambled um, and deleted the email addresses on all my customers, we, we have a report that would list the customer numbers and the activity that happened, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't actually store any of the data. So it would tell you that, that the scrambling has been done and that the email addresses were removed, but there's no log saying what, what, what the email addresses were. So that way you can demonstrate compliance pretty easily. Um, you know, I mentioned, you know, SAP is a big market and, and a lot of large companies run SAP. So many of our customers are some of the largest customers, largest companies in the world. Um, you know, British American Tobacco is one that sticks out on the screen, but, um, you know, there's, this is something that's, that's, that's right at the core of a lot of large enterprises, and large enterprises typically uh, run large ERP platforms like SAP. So you can imagine the customer base that we've built up on this solution. Another um, aspect of, of our technology on the far right there talks about divestitures. Um, this is interesting and unique in that when you, um, you know, as companies operate, they're, they're acquiring and, and divesting businesses. 
So a unique capability of our technology is the ability to carve out an individual company so that uh, you can maintain compliancy there as well. So if a company, uh, if your company divests or spins off a division, you can actually carve and spin, carve off that data from the SAP system, create a new SAP system so that divested business can operate and, and move off in their own direction and maintain their own compliancy. So, um, you know, we, we, we definitely limit the risk if there is a breach. So if you're protecting the PII data at its source, um, then uh, if there is a breach, the, 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 ex the exposure is less for sure. Um, with our replication technology, we recommend the customers use column and row filtering to take, you know, to make sure that if they're using business data, that they're eliminating the PII data. Um, companies, companies run their businesses on data. So uh, understanding what they're trying to do and with their data and where they're creating a competitive advantage sometimes just deals with, with the operations of the business. How many orders do we process, so, you know, month to month? Uh, is our business seasonal? What does our supply chain look like? Uh, wh you know, wh what are our shipping routes? Um, you know, things, things that affect the data that don't affect PII and for, or that, that, that don't impact PII. So we're encouraging companies that when they're, when they're doing analytics and, we're, and they're building data warehouses and they're loading data lakes, that they're carefully looking at it and, and choosing the data that they want in those environments based on the business need. So, you know, typically you might look at it and say, well, let's just take everything and move it into the data lake. Uh, well, that could create risk. So a lot of times we're looking at companies saying, okay, what, what's the business problem you're trying to solve? What are you trying to do in the analytics? And how are you trying to use that to impact your business and create a competitive advantage? A lot of times it, it just deals with the logistics of the business and not the PII data. So in those situations, we're encouraging companies to do filtering and make sure that they're not proliferating PII data where they don't have to. So a lot of people ask us, are we GDPR compliant? Um, you know, th there is no GDPR compliant certification process. So uh, it's not a prescriptive technology. Companies have to interpret the requirements and apply them accordingly. So where Attunity comes in is, is we want to be, we want to be a positive um, aspect of every company's enterprise. So, so every large company, or small, medium, and large company um, that has data we want to be we, we want to we want to be seen as um, helpful in your GDPR journey. Some of it might be really obvious, like with the right to be forgotten. But as you proliferate data and use data in your organization, we want to be able we want to be able to help companies look at that, understand their interpretations of GDPR, and figure out where we can help. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. <clears throat> yeah, we want to leave a few minutes here for Q and A, and we had a bunch of really good commentary going in the chat window. I always love seeing how engaged people are over there, and there were a number of questions around how to solve the broader issue of data governance. And of course, you know, GDPR is a good reason to, it's a good catalyst, I suppose, to focus more broadly on data governance practices. You know, I've spent a lot of times working with large organizations that maybe Matt will just kind of get your commentary on this, but a lot of times you really do need a crisis or some kind of catalytic event to kick people into gear and to get things rolling because otherwise you just kind of have the status quo. So I throw two things out, two questions out to you. One, have you seen that GDPR is serving as a good catalyst to get people talking about data governance programs? And then the other question I ask you is about having some adversarial role within the program, meaning have someone whose job it is to act like the regulator and to poke around. You know, I mentioned, I think, during the webcast here, the concept of the chaos monkey. It's very interesting. If you look on Wikipedia, you can look up chaos monkey or just Google it. But basically, it's a program at Netflix where they actually will use this chaos monkey to shut down production systems and see how well they respond. So it's, there would be a similar idea here with a person whose job it is to just poke around and find trouble, pretend to be the regulator, poke holes, call people out in meetings and so forth, and use that as your mechanism to frankly prepare for if and when that regulator comes along. So first of all, have you seen these regulations, and as I suggest we're gonna get some new ones coming down the pike real soon, not just around social media, but I guarantee around data use and privacy here in the US, most likely inspired by GDPR. So do you think that's a good catalyst? And the second part is what do you think about the idea of having a, a pseudo regulator on your team? Yeah, I think that I think they're both great ideas. Um, 
you know, what's 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 happening with GDPR is a convergence of news with you know with a with a with a law. So, um, you know, if there was no news on this, if this was not a problem and this law was coming down, it would definitely be having less impact. But the fact that there is every week some some new report, um, you know, like I don't know, Eric, I I use LifeLock and. Uh, you know that that protects my credit and protects my identity. And every time there's one of these breaches, I get a notification. And it's interesting because, you know, sometimes it impacts me if I'm a customer of that company or not. And other times it doesn't. But what 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 boggles my mind is how often this is happening. How often people have data breaches. And you know, GDPR is coming along right at the right time. And again, with what's going on in Washington right now with Facebook, people are going to be looking for a model. And they're not going to want to reinvent the wheel. And if this works for the EU, I can see this becoming a standard. So, so I see that I see I see a lot of what's happening in the news being a catalyst for ensuring compliance and and possibly broader adoption of this. Um, yeah. I've never. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say one one of the other threads going on in the chat window here deals with artificial intelligence and AI just in the background crawling around looking for. Uh, different systems, different data sets to align. I think that's really going to be the future for data governance is to have some kind of machine learning in the background, constantly looking for holes, poking for holes. And of course, you have to mm -hmm. train these algorithms so when they find holes, when they find problems, there's a pattern that they're going to see underneath the, the covers here. One aspect of which is probably going to be related to personnel. We notice that we keep finding this particular person is involved in projects that have difficulties or have holes. That has to be one way to do it because trying to manually work through all this stuff, that's almost impossible, especially at these larger organizations. So I see AI as being really rather important in the near future for being able to deal with data governance. What do you think? Yeah, I agree 100%. AI is, is being used in that uh, in that scope right now, um, a lot of our banks, or a lot of our customers are banks, and banks uh, have fraud detection programs. I mean, you, we, a lot of people on this call, and me, me included, we've had the situation where, you know, we, we buy something on a website that we normally don't, uh, or, we buy, or we're traveling and we make a purchase in, 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 a, in a manner that, out, that goes outside of our purchasing habits, and your credit card gets shut down, and it's, an, it's amazing how fast those fraud detection uh, algorithms kick into gear, and what drives that is data. And again, that's why that's why Attunity has a number of large banks as customers because companies need to need to process that data um, on the fly. So, and that's where AI comes in. AI means we need to, we have data streaming right now from multiple sources, and we need to be able to analyze and act on that data right now. And and that's where our replication technology comes in because you got to keep that data moving. And you know, if you've got your AI algorithm set up, you know, whether it be fraud detection or 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 security risk and, and compliance here with GDPR, um, that AI definitely is going to play a larger role long term. Yeah, and the other big component here is just culture and the people involved, right? I mean, data stewards are going to be really important. You want all the right people in your data governance program to be at the table and to have some stake. That obviously requires a, a significant amount of effort. But it seems to me that the cultural aspect is really important, and culture is very hard to change. You know, how do you how do you change culture? It's not an easy thing to do. And I think that uh, the other topic we didn't really dive into is that of the CDO, like who should be responsible for all of this. It seems to me the data governance program really should roll up to the chief data officer. But what do you think? I agree, and we're seeing a new role out there called a DPO, a data protection officer. Uh, when we talk to an EU company about their GDPR requirements, one of the first things I ask them is, "What what does the team look like? What does your compliance team look like? Who's what, you know? What aspects of the business make that team up? What aspects from IT, um, et cetera?" And there's a lot of common threads, and one of the things that's a common thread is the DPO. There's a you know data protection officer. There's even com uh, companies that have a DPO for every region. You know how data is used in Finland and how this is. Uh, how GDPR is enforced in Finland might be different than how it's done in Germany. So, um, yeah, these are, yeah, these are these are growing roles. Well, and I would throw out again this concept of having a pseudo regulator within your organization who pokes around and looks for problems and documents those problems, and that can be used as fodder by the head of the data governance program to make changes where necessary. 
You know, we need to realize that not everyone is cut out for a role in data governance. Not everyone is cut out for a role in analytics. It just depends. But you need to document who you are tracking, what you're doing, what kind of efforts you're making. The key, if a regulator shows up, is to have that documentation. And folks, mm -hmm. we are burning through the end of the hour here, so I'm going to hand it back to Shannon Kemp to wrap us up. But thank you so much for all of your time and attention, and thanks to our friends from Attunity for bringing us their perspective. Shannon? Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Matt, for these great presentations. And just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Friday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording of this session. And um, thanks to our attendees for the great questions. Just love that. And I hope everyone has, and thanks again to Attunity for sponsoring this Deep Dive Radio program. So hope everyone has a great day. Enjoy. Bye-bye.